Hello, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Abby Cornett, and I am the patient advocate for IG Living Magazine. This podcast is brought to you by IG Living Magazine to give readers an opportunity to hear from healthcare experts on topics important to them. Episode number nine, episode title, Advocacy versus Self-Advocacy. In this episode, we will discuss the differences between the role of patient advocacy and self-advocacy. Today, we have a guest speaker, Megan Ryan. Megan is a 1998 graduate of Texas A&M University, where she earned a Bachelor's of Business Administration in Business Analysis and Business Honors. After graduating from Texas A&M, Megan worked for PwC, a global professional service firm, for over 21 years. For more than 20 years, Megan has lived with common variable immune deficiency. Through her work with the Immune Deficiency Foundation, she helps educate patients and healthcare providers about primary immune deficiency diseases and serves as a peer support coach and support group leader. She's involved in a state in state and federal advocacy efforts to support her patient community. Additionally, Megan was the sole U.S. contributor to the International Patient Organization for Primary Immunodeficiencies Learning Expedition to identify, analyze, and provide recommendations on issues brought about by the COVID-19 pandemic for patients with primary immune deficiencies. Megan is now a contributing writer to IG Living Magazine and authors a quarterly patient perspective article. Good morning, Megan. Good morning. It's great to be with you this morning. It's it's great to have you um, here today. I followed your work in advocacy for a while now, and I thought you would be the perfect person uh, to have as my guest today for this topic. And the topic, the role of patient advocates versus self-advocacy, and why both are critical for patient outcomes. But before we get started, why don't you give me uh, and our listeners a little background on yourself and how you became involved in both advocacy and self-advocacy. Sure. So it was over 22 years ago when I was out of college. I was beginning my career. I had gotten married to my husband. I was doing all those great life things. And I was diagnosed with a primary immunodeficiency disease called common variable immune deficiency. Yes, that is a mouthful. And no, there's nothing common about it. I was thankful for a rather quick diagnosis, and that a treatment option was available. My doctor specifically advised me to focus on the positive that the treatment option was available and that it would be successful. I heeded his advice and focused on the positive and still keep doing that today. Over the course of those 20 plus years, I have learned so much about being my own best advocate for my medical care and learning from others, listening to others, trusting but verifying everything, as well as more recently, getting involved and having a voice for our community, a voice for all of those who are on immunoglobulin therapies and better understanding the issues around immunoglobulin therapy, some that even encumber patients and keep them from getting access to treatment, that led me to be a voice on some key issues at the state and federal policy level to change some wrongs to rights and improve the treatment and care that our patients get on immunoglobulin therapy. You know, that, that that's so similar in a lot of ways to my, yeah, my personal story. Um, I was young and on the police department and started getting sick continually and, you know, newly married. So, you know, I, I, I've walked those steps before. It's, 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 inter- it, it's interesting how close a lot of people's stories are. Yes. Uh, And everybody's story is different. Yes. But it is a joy when you get to meet people because it took about nine years for me to ever meet someone with my same diagnosis. 
But when you do, you feel empowered to know there's another person like me. I'm not alone. That is so true. Um, Megan, you know, we were both, we're both involved in patient advocacy, but our current roles are very different. In the past, I was very active in the political side of advocacy and ran a nonprofit in Washington, D.C. However, um, when I took the job at IG Living, my role was significantly changed and it was more directed directly towards uh, patient education and helping patients find the needed resources um, so they could access their care. Can you please explain to our listeners your role in patient advocacy and how your work is vital to patients? So both of those roles are very important. But what I have learned is once I got past the getting to a level of comfort where I felt that I know I could also be comfortable very much advocating for myself, I had an opportunity to advocate for a broader group of people. And going and talking to policymakers, legislators, their staff, understanding issues that affect our community. So I am thankful. I have amazing parents. And one gave me the gift of speaking and being comfortable with speaking to just about any person. And so it is through actual reach outs from patient advocacy organizations, those national patient advocacy organizations, where they provided me an opportunity to, and it was really during the pandemic, uh, to meet with legislators and their staff online and tell my story. And it was that first interaction in 2021, which really got me engaged and helped me understand that my voice matters and that my experiences are tools for change. And so that helped me understand that by sharing my, even my experience, that I could demonstrate to people making important decisions that policies impact real people. And I was one of those real people that their policies impacted. I also learned that you know, making personal connections with elected officials can be valuable and can you can influence their decisions when you tell them what is important to you and your the community that you represent. So it was that person first opportunity uh, to have those legislative staff member meetings in 2001 where I got engaged and realized there are quite a few issues that impact our community. Oh, you know, you are so right. And um, I don't share with our listeners very often, but uh, after I transitioned from the police department, I was a senator for eight years. And those meetings with people on whatever the issue is, when you can put a face to a story and connect it to that bill that's in front of you. Because a lot of times all you're presented with um, when you're in public office is what's called a fiscal note. How much is this going to cost? And the the flip side of that is how much is it going to cost if you do it or don't do it? What, what are the ramifications to the people? And not only to the people, but to the budgets. Because sick people don't, don't pay taxes to the same level. They, they don't they contribute. Can't work. And oh, they can't what... contribute to their econ- the economy. Yeah. They can't contribute to their communities. Exactly. So I, want, I want even those who are living with chronic disease to be valuable contributors yes. to their community in the best way that they possibly can. Exactly. That, that, that's a great way to say that. Um, Megan, I am currently working on a column for our August issue of IG Living entitled The Importance of Self-Advocacy. On that topic, I discuss how vital self-advocacy is for patients um, in managing their disease, and particularly those that are newly diagnosed patients. Can you explain to our readers why you feel self-advocacy is so important to patients and how it can help them manage their disease and how it helped you come to terms with your illness? 
certainly. So self-advocacy, and that's um, speaking out for yourself in with those in your family, those in your medical team, is that foundation of beginning to, one, embrace your diagnosis, and two, begin to discuss with others what is important to you, set goals for yourself, and be very clear in communicating what your needs are. So self-advocacy is so important to get what you need. And it requires that you have become a student of your diagnosis. And I say that I had an amazing leader who I worked with at PwC that trained all of us to become a student of the client and a student of the industry in which that client was working in and really just dig in and learn all that you can. And I've applied that to my diagnosis, my primary diagnosis. And, and like a lot of patients in our communities have complex needs and uh, some way along, along the way acquire additional diagnoses. That's the phase of life I am in. Um, and so I have learned to be a student of my chronic condition and keep learning and staying abreast of developments and asking questions and getting clear definitions on what this means. And that's where I feel knowledge is power. And education makes me feel more empowered to have a voice for myself and to better communicate with my healthcare team what is important to me, what are the, again, then what are the goals that I have? You can live a really, really impactful life with chronic illness if it is well managed. And even if it is not well managed, that's or when it's not well managed, that's when you don't feel like you're contributing, even at home. So getting to the point of feeling that your diagnosis is manageable and that you have power over that diagnosis changes the course of a patient's life and changes the perspective for that patient. Absolutely. And, you know, one, one other point about education, particularly for people with rare diseases or diseases that are maybe not even that common, we won't go so far as rare, because a lot of our patient groups have, you know, diseases most people have heard of, um, is the doctor that you're seeing may not remember or may not really know what that disease is. Yes, your healthcare team does, but I can't tell you how many times I've had a patient contact me and say, I had to go to the ER and the ER doctor had no idea what I was talking about. And I can't, I can't tell you how many times I've had ER doctors when I've been at conferences say, yeah, I've had people come up to me and I'm, I'm out there Googling WebMD. <laughs> Be yes. Not all doctors specialize in your disease, a chronic illnesses, disease state. And they, it may have been just a small section of their education. And that doesn't mean that they're bad at their job. It just means they can't know everything. So if you can go in and say, this is what I have, this is what it means, this is what my blood work should look like, that that can really help. All of that is so important, Abby, both in, and I want to say in two areas, you have broad generalists like internal medicine doctors, primary care doctors, as well as emergency room physicians. Both are critical members of the healthcare community. And I think it is important that patients who live with complex disease states be able to share. They, you need a primary care physician on your team. You cannot manage all of your care through, through specialists and subspecialists. You do need a primary care physician. And sometimes it is hard to find that physician. But I have been very fortunate to be able, and this is in the past two years, to find a primary phys care physician who was not scared of working with a patient with a comp complex condition and was willing to learn herself. 
And that first appointment, I brought with her the Immune Deficiency Foundation's Patient and Family Handbook. And I introduced myself in a 30-minute sales pitch. A 30-minute, no, it was actually 30 seconds because I realized I had to get her attention uh, quickly and offered her the opportunity to work with me. And I told her, these are, I've tabbed out these sections of this handbook. This is what you need to know about me if you want to work with me. And I said, I can understand if I'm not the type of patient you want to work with. And she looked at me and she's like, I'm always up for a challenge. And the amazing thing is few patients ever come to me with a gift at the first appointment. Thank you. I will read this cover to cover to learn how to care for you. I that that is I, I have a doctor because I moved to California a few years ago, and when I first went in, he he, he was like, "Eh, <laughs> this is no other word." Um, the last visit I had, we were looking for something in my medical records. He threw me half my file and said, "You know this better than I do. Find it." And we're sitting there in the office together, reading in his office, looking for something that he needed. He's, you know, he literally looked at me and goes, you know this better than I do. And that's, that's very key to your care. And that's key to your care. And, you know, I, I avoid emergency departments, emergency rooms at nearly all costs, sometimes to my detriment. Yeah. But I, <laughs> encourage, I encourage patients, you have to have a 30 second pitch to that emergency room doctor to get their attention. You cannot tell them your 30-year medical story. You have to have what is most important to you so they understand you quickly. Again, you have 30 seconds to get their attention, not, and that may mean consolidating your 30-year health history into 30 seconds, but you've got to get their attention so they can rapidly, rapidly treat you and get you triaged and into the best um, improved state that you can in an emergency setting. So again, knowledge is power. Knowing how to communicate your own, your diagnoses effectively is also very important. And it sometimes takes practice. And maybe you need to try having a three by five note card that summarizes things. So in an emergency situation, you are not in a crisis and like all frazzled because of that emergency. You need to be prepared for the emergency. That that is very true. The other the other thing, and this is a little caveat to that, is if you have a family member, caregiver, or spouse, they have to have some basic knowledge too. Because I I, I personally have been sick enough where talking to the ER doctor wasn't necessarily an option. And if if you're fortunate enough to have a person in your life to go with you to the ER, they need to ha- have a basic knowledge also and be able to advocate for you in that situation. Most definitely. And even have, um, have a summary information about your health history so they can speak for you. Yes. In my case, what I have done is created a Google Doc and shared with my husband, my best friend, and my mom. That's a really good idea. The first page of it is what you need to know the basics of me, then the following pages, and it goes on a little while, maybe a dozen or two dozen pages, has all the details. But again, if I was in an emergency situation, that first page pretty much tells everything they need to know and would get their attention rather quickly. That that is a fabulous idea. Um, Yeah, that's really, you know, that's very, very good idea. I'm thinking about it. Um, Megan, besides educating yourself, because that, that is very important, patients a lot of times need additional emotional or social support, um, what are some groups that you would recommend or what? how would you recommend that they reach out to get that additional help that they need? First, I want to reflect back on my diagnosis in 2001. My physician told me specifically, don't go searching on the internet. 
Well, in 2001, thankfully, the internet was not what it is today. And I didn't go wildly searching. In fact, he gave me a little pamphlet that I still have that was from NIH, about 10 pages about primary immune deficiencies. And a lot has changed in those 20 years, thank goodness. But that's what I relied upon. Um, and that served me well for a period of time. But what I will tell you is it is important to focus on trusted sources of medical information from patient advocacy organizations. We have patients in this community who are readers of IG Living Magazine that are from a broad group of patient communities. And almost all of those patient communities have national or international patient advocacy organizations that have vetted medical information that are an outstanding start to becoming that student of your diagnosis and staying up to date with information, whether it be come through webinars, reading, blog posts, podcasts, etc. I encourage patients not to go to Dr. Google as their first place for medical information. But the advent of social media has offered online support groups and online information, but the age old statement, trust but verify, is you may learn things on those online forums that you need to vet with your medical team. Your medical team is always the one who you should be collaboratively making decisions with. I also encourage patients to use the resources of those patient advocacy organizations for patient support groups. The pandemic has brought a lot of negative changes to our world, but many of these patient support groups went online with Zoom meetings. So those are no longer in-person meetings. They are now on Zoom that can be accessed in the comfort of your home, whether you're working out of town or on vacation, they're still accessible. And so those support groups, and you don't even have to be geography bound. Tonight, I will lead the IDF's Get Connected group for Houston. And we have people who come to Houston from all over the state and like to stay for their medical care and like to stay connected to those who know the medical community in Houston. But we have people from Florida, Kansas, New Jersey, and New York that have become a part of our group. Perhaps it's good old Texas hospitality that keeps them coming back, but that they find the group has the right, has the right vibe for them. So finding that support group um, that you can connect with that gives you the support you need. And it's also finding people in your community that you are can engage with and can be supporters of you. I have that squad of people that I have met through the patient community that I have one friend, we probably text daily. We have similar passions. We love to travel. We also love gardening. And so we're always sharing about what's happening in our lives, yet the, our diagnosis is not central to that. We've just become amazing friends. And she is a person who I'm always going to and vice versa. We're always helping each other out. So finding that squad that you can go to to support you. I would be remiss to, if I didn't mention Patient support groups are not substitutes for mental health care. And you must also consider if you do need that support to use mental health resources as well. Yeah, that, that is something that I had failed to mention when we were talking before the meeting is so many patients with chronic illness um, have a comorbidity of depression or anxiety. And absolutely as part of their self-advocacy 
reaching out to a mental health provider and finding the, that care also, that is as important as your physical care, without a doubt. Exactly. Um, thank you so much. Um, as I've really enjoyed our talk today and we're kind of wrapping up. Um, if you had one last piece of advice to give patients, um, particularly the newly diagnosed, what would it be? When you're newly diagnosed, it may feel overwhelming, but I would say that you are in a place where you have treatment available and to focus on the positive. Yes, you may have been through a diagnostic odyssey that led you to your diagnosis that took years or months, and it may seem overwhelming to you. But focus that you have the diagnosis and that treatment options are available. And the beauty of the world that we live in is they are rapidly evolving. When I was diagnosed, we did not have the innovation in 2001 that we have today that has led to different modalities of IG infusion therapy. I only relied, my only option was IVIG in a clinic setting. Today, we have so many more options, home infusion, uh, subcutaneous infusion, facilitated subcutaneous infusion. And I think in a matter of years, we will see some different, whether it be pump technology or delivery technology that will continue to advance. So focus on the positive is my key piece of advice. And find people that can be on the journey with you. Find people who are your support system and lean into that support system. Thank you so much. It, it's been a real pleasure having you as our guest today. Um, and thank you again for explaining um, your role as a patient advocate and how important self-advocacy is. I'm sure our readers are really going to enjoy this episode. It was super informative. Thank um, you, Abby, for the invitation to join you. Thank you. Listeners, thank you again for joining us today. Additional information regarding this podcast can be found on our website at www.igliving.com. If you have a question that was not answered, please contact me at acornet at igliving.com. Look for the next IG Living podcast announcement on our website for the opportunity to submit your questions. IG Living Advocate is a copyright production of IG Living Magazine, published by FFF Enterprises, the only magazine for the immunoglobulin community comprised of patients who suffer from chronic illness and their caregivers.